Welcome, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to our conversation with Peggy Budd tonight. Um, as I said, we're connected to Faith Facebook Live and we are recording. For those of you who do not know the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, I want to share a little bit before we start. We call ourselves CPAC and we are Connecticut's Parent Training and Information Center under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It is our philosophy that parents make the best advocates for their children. The mission of Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center is to educate, support, and empower Connecticut's diverse families of children and youth with any disability or chronic illness, ages birth to 26, and the professionals who serve them. All of our staff are, pa are parents of children who have disabilities themselves. And as such, I want to just remind everyone and ask everyone if you have questions that are personal to consider that we're in a public setting. And if you prefer, we are happy at CPAC to take an individual phone call and do a private consultation for free. And we'll put our, con our um, contact information in the chat. But for tonight, if we can have questions that are more uh, group oriented, and um, we do encourage that people are engaged and uh, discussed throughout the session. We like to be interactive. And my last comment is we are not lawyers and none of this is meant to represent any legal advice. So with that, welcome Peggy. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? I sure would. I'm going to start by sharing my screen so that I think that might be helpful. Um, and I see we have another guest. And I'm going to say, to start with, uh, I love people to, uh, Marissa, if you could turn on your camera, I'd love to see you. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Um, please, and whoever's coming in, uh, and please feel free to ask questions, interrupt, because I want this to be a conversation. We're going to be talking about families and educators and the value of how to communicate and collaborate. Um, as um, you know, my name is Peggy Budd. I'm the founder of uh, Speaking Skillfully. And what I do is I am, first of all, a licensed speech language pathologist. I'm also a, I'm trying to get my, there we go, um, a, a licensed school administrator. And I worked in public education for over 25 years. And then 10 years ago, I started speaking skillfully because I really wanted to act as a communication and education consultant. I want to help families and educators be able to more effectively communicate with each other with um, that my goal is to help them build homeschool partnerships. Because as Jane said, really parents can be the best advocates for their kids. And it's important that parents and educators work together so that they really do create a good team. That is the intention of IDEA, that parents are on the team. And that's because that's really important. I see communication as at the core of everything we do. And what we're going to be stressing tonight is what my motto is. It's more than what you say, it's how you say it. Uh, Jane, I think there's somebody else that needs to come in. Okay. All right, so. Um, hmm. I show everyone admitted. I'm sorry. Let me look again. It's okay. All right. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's by George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And I think that happens so often, whether we are a parent or whether we are an educator, we speak, we deliver a message, we have a conversation, and we truly believe that everything we said was understood and was not misunderstood. However, that isn't always the case. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that tonight because that's really important. And I'm going to give you some strategies and things to think about so that you make sure that you aren't 
misunderstood or misinterpreted and that your message is clear so that you, as whether you're a parent or whether you're a teacher, you can advocate for the child. That being said, I want to stress this. Too often, um, we get confused about what our goal is. Our goal as educators and as parents is to ensure that the child, the student, gets what they need to be able to be successful in school, whether it be academically, socially, emotionally, behaviorally. We want them to get what they, the supports they need. Too often, parents come to the meeting and sometimes talk about what they want for their child. And what I do when I work with families is I help them learn how to make sure that it's not what they want, but to talk about what the child needs. Too often, school districts, as when they're talking, talk about what our our district has to offer rather than what the child needs. And I'm going to stop sharing because I want to talk to all of you for a little bit. I want to share a couple of stories. First of all, as far as school districts, um, one of the things that I do is I'm on the board of directors for Bridge Academy, which is a charter school in Bridgeport. And as part of what I'm doing is bringing the special ed perspective to the team. And I've been uh, coming to the special ed meetings and really helping the special education teachers understand how to look at the IEP, how to make changes so that they're not addressing and delivering programs or the way the school is running, but that they are really starting to move to really look at how they can meet the individual needs of the student. I'm also helping them understand how to really bring parents into the conversation and things are really moving along and it's, it's very exciting. Now I want to share a story with you just to highlight how um, things can happen. I had a client a few years ago who came to me to help have the family help them uh, effectively deliver the message of what they believe their child needed to be successful. And they felt the district wasn't giving it to the, their son. So we work together and I like if possible to work behind the scenes. So the night before the PPT meeting, I was meeting with the family and we were going through what they were gonna say. As Vanessa, as I was talking to you before, I was helping them kind of write out a script and whatever. And as we're talking, I noticed from across the table that the mother kept writing, I want, I want. And when she wrote it for the third time, I said, this isn't about what you want. And she got very flustered and said, you're right. And she took the paper, wanted it up in a ball. And I can still see her throwing it on the floor, getting out a new piece of paper and picking it up. And we started and we started talking about what does, what does your son need? And then a very important thing, why? And I had helped the family go through and we had collected some data. I'd had them get some evidence. This was a few years ago and some of the things we have available today weren't there, but they were able to, to collect data and have evidence. And so then the mom and dad went to this meeting and talked about what their child needed. And it was very exciting because as they shared the evidence and really highlighted based on real um, data, what their child needed, they were able to accomplish that. And their child got the extra supports and reduction in homework, uh, modified homework, and a few things that the school had been really adamant about not giving him, and they did. So again, it's really important to make sure that we talk about what the child or the student needs. Okay, I want to go back to um, as well as having the supporting information, as you talked about having the data. And I know a lot of parents ask us, how do I get data as a, as a parent? And I think maybe at some point, that's something you're going to talk about, Peggy, is the different ways parents can demonstrate why they think their child needs something. Sure. And actually, 
we could talk of, you know what, why don't we just talk a little bit about it now? Because I think that that's a really important question. For example, if, um, if you're concerned about your child's reading and you think that, that they're struggling, to, to just say that isn't enough. Bring one, bring a book, bring, maybe bring the book that the teacher has been expecting your child to read from, and then bring a book that your child is successfully reading from. Take your phone, make a, a you know, a 30, 60 second video of your child, perhaps trying to read the book that they're struggling with, or just showing how easily they're reading the book that you think is successful. That is very, very powerful and will really make a difference in you um, highlighting what's going on. Another thing is to keep a chart. If, um, if every time you ask your child to do his homework, he has a meltdown, make a list, kind of keep a graph, okay, the day and he had a meltdown. Or if you have to ask him six times, keep a chart. You know, I, I, he never does his homework until I ask him six times or he never does his homework until eight o'clock at night. And then you have some evidence and you can, you can collect that. Collect schoolwork, create what is almost called like a portfolio of his work, the homework. If you have homework and you worked with the, the student, make some notes, let the, let the teacher know, or at least when you go to the meeting, show, well, I had to help my child do this. I'm not talking about doing it for them, but how much support did they need? Make sure, or if the child could, uh, what did you do? Do you have to give them one direction at a time? Start collecting that data. Jane, is there something you want to add or is that a good start? I think that's great. Um, I really like when you say, you know, maybe make a note on the paper. Um, you know, he was able to do that with three prompts or, you know, I, my favorite story with my son was he was doing multiplication of fractions and he was writing the numbers all around the page as, you know, his and then that was what we handed in. And they called me immediately and said, what was that? And I said, that was him doing his work independently. And that created the perfect conversation for us to figure out how to make this work more effectively for him, which was in the solution was he got a whiteboard. He would transfer the one problem onto the whiteboard, solve it, and then put the answer on the page. It was his visual motor challenges that were preventing him from really doing math in the, in the linear way and, you know, in the boxes that they needed to be. And so with the whiteboard, he could really do the visual focus and get the right answer and put it back on the page. But never having seen that in the classroom, I did not know that he needed that accommodation. And so I did not have that accommodation right. until they saw the page with the numbers all over it and said, there's a disconnect here. And we, we made that connection. That's great. And also, I mean, for example, your child, you might find that at home, if you let your child sit on a soft, comfy chair or uh, some kids actually do better lying on the floor, on their bellies, on a clipboard because they get um, upper body stability. And if that, if your child is being forced at school to sit in a chair, then it might be a problem. And the teacher says, well, he's so wiggly and he's not doing this. And all of a sudden you say, but at home, he lies on the floor and he, you know, we have a clipboard or, a, or we put things on a, a slant board or whatever you're doing. And all of a sudden, so if you as a parent have made some modifications, then you need to share those. You, what you share is as important as what the school shares. And sometimes parents happen upon something that really works and the school is going to be thrilled. Remember, you are an expert on your child at what he does at home. And please don't ever feel intimidated or uh, feel that what you have to say is of less value because it isn't. What the school sees and they have great value and they are very knowledgeable. And that's why going back to IDEA that the law says that both parents and teachers need to be part of this team. It's because 
together you each bring a perspective and then together you see the total child. So I want to talk about um, the attributes of communication. And I wanna share this because I think it's so important. Um, many years ago, actually back in the 1960s, if it's like a lifetime ago, um, a psychologist whose name was Albert Morabian did this study. This study is still considered very powerful and very important today. And you might have seen these statistics, which says that only 7% of a message is your words. And you might say, well, wait a minute, what I have to say is so important. Yes, it is. What his study found was that if your words and your vocal tone and clarity and passion um, and your body language and your uh, gestures and your eye contact, if all of those don't send the same message, then your words are not gonna probably be remembered. They're not gonna be as valuable. If in fact, what you say, and remember what I said, it's more than what you say, it's how you say it. If how you say it um, is the same as what you're saying, it's going to be powerful and it's going to be remembered. And I think that's very important. And I'm going to talk about the key attributes in detail right now. So words, words are important. I'm not saying they're not, um, but they have to also, how we say them is important. So if you have something to tell, if you give a long laundry list, people aren't going to remember it. There's something called the rule of three. Does anyone know what the rule of three is? No? Okay, well, I will tell you. The rule of three found out, first of all, we remember things in groups of three and our world is in groups of three morning, afternoon, evening, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, things in the church, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, um, all kinds of things are in groups of three. And that's sort of the way things happen. And our brains keep that and we, we function that way. So if you're going to, what happens is if you're going to tell somebody something, um, these are the my child's strengths, or these are the things he struggles with, or the teacher is going to tell, these are the things that the student does at school. It's really important not to give more than three pieces of information at one time. And what they found in, in when they did research is, let's say I was, you know, I was going to throw you a ball, okay? Think about what happens if I throw you, let's say a ball and you kind of catch it a big ball, not a little, so that I can hold them. And then you throw me another one and I kind of maneuver it and you throw me a third one, I'm okay. If you throw me the fourth one, this is what happens. I drop them all, that's number one. And number two, my brain forgets the other three. I forget, I have nothing. So if you tell me three pieces of information, I will remember. When you tell me four, I remember zero. And so you don't want that, you want the teacher or the parent to remember what you say. So speak and think about rules of three. The other thing we were, so let's talk about vocal. Think about how many times you have said to somebody, I didn't like their tone. You didn't. They could have said, I, I mean, I've been on the phone, somebody you're trying to return something and you think that they have the cop an attitude, even though if you think about what they, all right, we'll take it back. You didn't remember that they said, all right, we'll take it back. You remember that they said it nasty. So your tone is so important. The way you say it, your clarity, your volume. If we yell, people don't listen. They stop listening when we yell. And thinking about if there's a word you really want to emphasize, stop and pause and let think about it. Those are so important and they will help people remember what you said and place value on it. Non-verbally, looking eye contact. And if you're on a Zoom call, which many of you might still be on Zoom calls, Look into that camera 
and make sure because that's the way I'm looking at you. If I was looking down like I'm now, it doesn't feel like I'm looking at you, right? But if I'm looking now, it feels like it. When you're in person, look at the person, smile. That is so important. It, it builds a bond. It makes a connection. Lean in. If you're sitting back in your chair like this, listening at a meeting, your, your arms, your body language says, I don't care. I'm not connected. And that goes for, it doesn't matter who, parent, teacher, educator, administrator. We need to show that we care, we're engaged, we're part of this conversation. Um, our posture, how we hold ourselves. If you're slumping like this, you might people might think you're depressed, you don't really care, you're not interested depending on who you are and what's going on. So look, you know, look with energy and have that energy. It's going to help. Also, I can't, when I was an administrator, I can remember parents listening to somebody and I can remember teachers listening to parents. And in both cases, they would roll their eyes or shake their heads and say, oh, you know, like I do. And I would sit there at, when I was an administrator and even when I was a speech pathologist and it would just break my heart because this was sending such a negative message. And the person who was speaking was really trying to get something across and the other people really weren't listening. And so it was a breakdown in communication. As I said, Moravian did this study. And one of the things that we know about this is that we, most of us are not auditory learners. Most of us are more likely visual or tactile kinesthetic or almost anything but auditory. And since visual is such an important part of, of how most of us learn, what we have found is that if the vocal, which is what we hear, which we're remembering, but in a more abstract way, and all of the nonverbal behaviors, that is what we remember. And when we remember that, not the tone of the person or their attitude, we then remember that positiveness and then we remember what they said. So that is so important. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I was thinking about when you talked about um, when people yell, other people don't hear them. And we talked to a lot of parents who yell. I'm going to be honest. Parents call us all the time. Sometimes they're yelling at us, right, Vanessa? Um, and we know they're not really yelling at us, that they're just upset. And we understand that. And that's fine. But what I want educators to understand is that when a parent is yelling, that means they don't feel they're heard, that they escalate to that yelling because they do not feel that what they've said prior to that has been acknowledged, listened to, understood. That's when parents get into that escalation. And so if you're an educator and you have someone yelling at you, it might be really good to reflect and say, maybe someone doesn't really listen to this person very much. Maybe it's not me, but they need to be heard. And maybe I can be the person who listens to them. You're right. And that's perfect because that's exactly what we're going to talk about now listening and there's an art to listening actually it's so interesting because people take public speaking classes teachers have learned everybody talks about how to speak and too often people don't talk about how to listen and what happens is a lot of times people listen only for the pause in the conversation so that they can say what they want to say they're playing in their brain what they want to say and that is not the way to have an effective conversation. It's not the way to advocate for your child. It's not the way for teachers to have parents become partners in this process. We have to listen and we have to be what's called active listeners. That means build on what somebody said. So if I, when the teacher says something or the parent says something, build onto it. That's one strategy. Another important thing to remember is one of the worst things we can do is say, yes, but. And that's what people do a lot. They listen to a parent, yes, but. And all that did, it was like 
you took something and you whacked the person at the knees and they fell down because now you have taken everything they said and you've invalidated it. You've said it was it had no value because you put the word but. All you had to do, whether it's the parent or the teacher, is say yes and, or let's add to that. Now we've taken what somebody has said, whether it's a concern, whether it's a complaint, whether it's a, a, you know any kind of an argument, whether they like it or just not, but, and talk about it. And now let's build on it. Another important part of listening is something called perspective taking. Perspective taking does not mean agreeing. Too often people think if I understand what the other person says, that means understand perspective equals agree, and that's not true. If I understand your perspective, we can have a better conversation because I can understand where you're coming from, you can understand where I'm coming from, and then we can do what I'm gonna talk about, go through the, the basically the, the five, what I like to think of as the five C's of communication. But this is what we've got to do. We've got to look at and think about perspective taking. And that's the only way we're gonna be good listeners and really be able to build and advocate for our, our, our kids whether you're the teacher or the parent. Do you want to add to that or is Jane? I'm good. Vanessa, any questions? Marissa? Marissa, do you have anything? No? Okay, no we have any? another caller. If you want to um, at any point unmute yourself and ask a question, please feel free. Yes, please. I want, I would love questions. Okay, the five C's of communication. And let's think about this is a framework of if you're sitting at a, whether it's an IEP meeting, whether it's just a parent conference, whether it's even um, any time that you're communicating, and this doesn't just apply to parents and educators, um, this framework, but let's go through it. So there are what I like to think about five C's. It's important to have a conversation. A conversation is a give and take. Um, and, and I'm going to go into it in more detail. Then the next thing is we're going to talk about the importance of cooperation, collaboration, compromise, and in the end, we may have to come to some consensus. So let's begin with a conversation, which is a give and take. Um, and it has to do with asking good questions and making clear comments, meaning not just telling what, but telling why. That's so important. And Jane was sharing a story. Do you want me to share it or do you want to share it, Jane? Well, I think if you're talking about the fact, um, well, why don't you share? Maybe it will, I'll make sure you were sharing the right story. Okay. Jane was sharing with me today that she was at a PPT meeting and that it was a, a meeting for somebody in transition. And the district asked the question of the parent, you know, does, the, does your daughter still have her job? And the answer was yes. That really shouldn't have been the question because it turned out that the, yes, she had a job, they were fearful that she was gonna lose the job and she was struggling and there were lots of things that needed to be addressed. And the district, if they had just gone with, yes, she has her job, okay, now we can move on. That was the goal, she has a job. That's not solving the problem. That's not having a conversation. So it's asking, what I like to talk about is deeper questions. It's, and it's asking more questions, it's probing, It's having a conversation. It would be beginning with, tell me how your daughter is doing um, at her job. Now, that's a good way to begin. If she didn't have the job, the parents would say, oh my God, she lost the, her job and, and we're really upset about it. Okay, that's fine. If she's having problems, well, she still has her job, but we're worried she's gonna lose her job. And we're worried because she can't do ABC now you're giving the district 
information that they can use do they at, that you're having a, um, a, a PPT meeting. Does she need more training? Does she need a coach? Does she need some more skill building? What does she need? That's the purpose of this meeting, not just to check off the box of, oh, she still has a job, we're done. That's not having a conversation. That's not building partnerships. And that's not the way to ensure that the child, the student gets what he needs. How did I do, Jane? I think you did well. I think I think that um, what it what, when they ask that question, I think we're also talking about having a shared understanding. So for the district, her keeping her job was their share their understanding of her success, and the parents belief of her success was different because they knew the struggles she was having when the district did not understand that. So. I think it's it's both asking the right question that's more open ended, as you say, not a yes or no kind of thing, as well as making sure we're all using the same um, standards of what might equal success in this particular example. Um, I think there's a lot of need to talk about shared understanding of the language that and the concepts, not just the language, but the concepts that we're talking about. That one person's view of she's doing well may not be another person's agreement of she's doing well. What does doing well mean? You know, so I think in this case, it was a matter of my job was to help the team come to the same place of what would be success for the student on the job. Does that right. make sense? And I agree with you. And I also think from my perspective, everyone, parents and district should always be trying to get the student to, to reach the highest level of excellence, should, should be as successful as possible. So even all of us, we can have a job where performing mediocre, or we can have a job and we can be the star performer. So we don't know where the student is, but they shouldn't be just looking up at, because that's the basic. It's like, it's like did, did your child come to school today? Yes, he got on the bus, he got off the bus and he went to school. Was he participating? Was he involved or did he spend the day under his desk or with his head down? Those are, you know, so, we want to make sure now if you didn't couldn't get him to go to school at all and the first step was to get him in the building then success is getting him in the building but if he comes into the building every day and doesn't do anything else then we have to keep raising the bar so the fact is she had a job that's number one that was the first thing the next step is how successful is she at that job and we kind of keep raising it and deciding what we need to do so and that should be Again, a shared understanding from the perspective of both parents and district that whatever the goal is, we start with a baseline and we always want to move higher and better. Just like some goals, we say the student can't do it. And so we want them to be able to do it 50% of the time. That's success. If they're doing it 50% of the time, then doing it 55% of the time, in my opinion, isn't really success. We haven't pushed them enough. Doing it from 50 to 75%, now we've made some progression. So we have to look at it and we have to look at what is their baseline, which is a whole other thing when we look at goals, but it's also about that conversation. So it really is. Um, and it's also making sure that we have data to support it. How is the, how is she doing? What is the data? Did she get a raise? Is she coming home crying? Is um, her boss complaining about her? And what are the strengths? What are the things that she is successful? I think you said she was successful at cleaning. So she has this good thing. So what we need to do is build on that and then and, and share that and then find what else we can build on. So that's really important. And the nice thing is it's exactly the, the trajectory that the meeting went to. So it was really, you know, it was really a great conversation, but sometimes you need to get over that little hurdle of, people might not be on the same page. How do we bring everybody together to the same page? Well, that goes right back to where I started. The biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it took place. So the district thought that they were effectively communicating by asking that question, and yet they weren't. 
And so it wasn't an intentional. That's why I like the word illusion. We think we're doing the right thing. And that doesn't mean that we are. And so we need to, to move forward. The next thing we need to think about is cooperation. If you're gonna to work together with a school district and a school district's gonna to work together with a parent, we need to cooperate. And cooperate really means that we need to have a shared goal. That is what drives cooperation. That we have to talk about, and it, it's all about talking about what the child needs and how we're going to educators have to see what the child needs. And it's all about everybody being on that same page, um, whether it's, and it can be a specific, getting the child to communicate better, getting the child to um, read better, getting the child to be more social, depends on, but we all have a shared goal. I mean, there isn't one shared goal, but we should, that's cooperation. Now, in addition to cooperating, it is very important that we collaborate and collaboration is a little different. What that means is we each have some goals that we want to accomplish and we have to work together to get them to move forward. So the parent may think that um, something really important for their child is that they have peer interactions, social interactions, that they feel like the child isn't doing anything. The teacher might want to make sure that the student is moving along in their reading or their math, their academics, and they say, well, they're not as concerned about the fact that the child isn't um, playing with kids at recess, he's learning. So, so together, but not that the parent doesn't want the child to learn and not that the district doesn't want the child to be social, but those aren't their priorities. So they each have their own goals that they have to collaborate with each other so that they can then create the best, most appropriate, most successful IEP so that it will meet that. But it's only gonna happen again, going back to those conversations. The parent needs to be talking about and sharing what are my you know what are my goals? What are my concerns about what my child needs? Remember, it's not what they want. And the district to say what are their concerns about how are they going to ensure that the student successfully accesses the curriculum and learns and makes progress on the goals and objectives and on the general ed curriculum. So Peggy, I want to just stop you here because goals are, when you look at Connecticut's IEP form, and we work with parents every day to explain what the document looks like, how they can read their own child's IEP, but when you get to the goal page, almost every parent says, I don't understand this. They might understand Johnny's going to improve his reading, and, and but they really don't understand what this looks like in the classroom. What will the teacher physically be doing with my child to get them to with this result? That's a very common question that we get. And my answer is always, you're going to have to ask the person who wrote the goal. You're going to have to sit down with them and say, tell me what this looks like, because it's usually a very complex goal with you know multiple objectives, and it isn't necessarily really clear. There's different codes for how it's going to be measured. Is there pre-data? Is there post-data? It may be done by testing. There's a lot of different ways these are measured. So it's really, I have found over the years, I really don't presume what the person who wrote the goal really meant to say. And I find that when parents do sit down and have that conversation, nine out of 10 times that goal gets changed because they have a real conversation about it. Most PPTs that I've been at, if a child has even three goals versus a child that might have 10, we don't talk about those goals at the PPT. We really don't talk about the specifics of the goal, how it's going to be measured, what it would look like in that classroom, so that when you talk about the conversation that leads to cooperation, where everybody knows we're helping Janie do this um, when she's learning how to read, I'm not sure that conversation happens often enough so that everybody really understands what is happening in the classroom and what that progress should be looking like at home. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. And I'll tell you, when I work with families, and even when I was an administrator, to me, the way I see the, the IEP is goal, 
goals and objectives should be driving all decision making. So if you don't, if you don't really discuss those goals, I think you're not really discussing what's going on, number one. And I am a firm believer in goals being written as SMART goals. And if a goal is written as a SMART goal, and I'll tell you a great story about that. I had a family and just what you said, the mother, th- I don't understand these goals. I'm not seeing progress. What's going on? So I sat down with them and I took every goal and we either, either I helped talk, talk the parent through how that it could look like a smart goal. Or I said, we don't have enough data here to even create a smart goal. So you have to talk. So I walked them through it and they got it so that every goal had a baseline. It said, where is the student currently performing on whatever? What will the student have to do under what circumstances to get to this end? And I will tell you that it was just a beautiful story because I remember the mother, I, I worked with her for like two years, I think. And the first um, year or so, I would, she would get the goals before the IEP meeting. And the first time it was major. And then, you know, we would come. And I remember the last time she, I went to see her, she said, look, all of these goals are great. The districts on my, you know, we're all working together. This is one goal. There's only one goal now that we need to work on. And she said, you know, I think this is how we need to do it. And she had just learned the whole process. And and the, the district was very amenable because they weren't asking, we were asking, how do we measure it? And I think that too often people think that it's just, oh, it, it, it seems so simple and it's not. Um, Oh, it's not simple and it needs to be, uh, and, and the goal has to really take the student from where he is and move him forward. And too often, a great way to think about it is think about a student who might have a spelling goal. Okay. And the spelling goal I've seen so many times where it will say, well, you know, we'll get 90% of his spelling words correct on his weekly test. And my first question is, well, before you have this goal, how many words was he getting correct on his weekly test? You know, how many words did he get correct on his pretest? And I started finding out with some kids that some kids were getting 50 or 60% on their pretest and then were getting 90% on that. Well, that's not great. The student who got 10% on the pretest and got 80% on the post test, they were learning. Or the student who was getting 100, but never carried out the goals in his writing. So he spelled it right on the test. And then the mother I can, mother would say, but look, he can't even spell go correctly or stop or whatever the words were. So then the goal needs to be rethought. It's not just about the grade on the test. It's about what, how are we going to move this along so that it will have meaning and move them along. So that's really where, but I think not talking about goals and objectives at an IEP meeting is a mistake, but that's, you know, cause I think that's what- I think it's very common. And I definitely am a big believer in asking for draft goals before the PPP. I agree. So that parents have a chance to review them and and get those questions answered even before the PPT, because the PPT isn't necessarily the best place to have that conversation, but um, it is a place to have that conversation. But um, there are still districts that will say we can't do draft goals because that's predetermination. And if it says draft on it, there's no predetermination. Of course. And that's, I mean, as I said, I'm writing this book and that's one of the things we've stressed in this book. Everything should be written draft. And I do believe that draft goals are important. You're not predetermining. You're making a suggestion. It's draw again, going back to what's the first thing. We have to have a conversation. The conversation has to begin somewhere. We So when we walk into that meeting, if we had the draft goals, we can begin the conversation. Uh, maybe I maybe I don't think that my child needs to memorize his spelling list. I want him to be able to learn three words that he's going to spell right when he does his writing. Uh, we can have that conversation. If I don't have anything, then I come to the meeting and I find parents look at an IEP goals at a meeting and they are overwhelmed. It's like 
they don't know what they're thinking. And you're right. They don't know how to respond. They need, I think that districts should have to give draft goals so that they can have a conversation or parents should just say with a thinking about the tone in a very polite uh, fashion, you know, this is the very first time I'm seeing these goals. I really feel that I cannot make any comments on them and I will need to uh, uh, look at them, have a discussion, and then we can come back. I will almost put money on the fact that if parents did that a couple of times, the district would change their policy because now they have to have two IEP meetings when they could have had one. And and, parent, and they can't argue with the parent. The parents are saying, I need to discuss. And sometimes the parents will come back and they'll say, all of these are fine, but these two aren't working or I don't understand this. And they make the changes. Like you said, they have a conversation. So I think that draft, the two things I believe in, draft goals and SMART goals. I think both of those will help parents see how that does drive program. So now that we've done all this it kind of months. We do need to sometimes compromise. Sometimes parents think that this is what their child needs and the district thinks this is what the child needs. And it's about having a conversation and thinking about making compromises to make sure that the child does move forward and make progress. And sometimes it might be I was at meetings when I was running them where parents wanted, you know, 50 goals. Well, nobody can work on 50 goals. So sometimes it's a matter of the district saying, okay, we can work on these things, but we can only do this. And then when he masters it, we can come back. Because remember, the law says that the goals that are written are supposed to be mastered in one year. I find that in most cases, a student with special needs is not going to master 10 pages of goals with five objectives on each page. And then they come back, well, they didn't do this, they didn't do this. Well, it's frustrating to everyone. And some of the goals, when you look at them, I have noticed are really things that you're doing anyway. Let's just pick the three or five things that we really feel we need to work on. You can work on those other things doesn't matter. They don't have to be a goal to be able to, to address them. And that's what I think parents don't always understand. We can work on it, but what are the things that we're really going to do because we want to move the child forward? And then the last thing is that when we do compromise and we've had this great conversation, we all have to come together and reach some kind of consensus that this is where we are going. So if we do that, then we should be able to avoid some breakdowns in communication and we should be able to start working as a team, parents and educators collaborating and communicating in the best interest of the student. Are there any questions or comments? Maria, Marissa, do you have anything you'd like to share? I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. Um, when let's say things have already gone downhill, <laughs> and they do, <laughs> yes. And um, with so much being done through, at least for our district, being done through email, and then the school, like, what's a reasonable time for a school district to return an email before? And like, in terms of who you CC on the email, what are we're newer to the process? <laughs> okay. Um, but when the school, like people are just being completely non-responsive for four or five days for something, a simple question. I don't, I, I mean, to me, that's, that's not acceptable. An email, um, unless there's some reason. Now, if you, if you send the email at three o'clock on Friday afternoon and the teacher yeah. doesn't <laughs> get back to you till Monday, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. But if we're talking about you send an email on Monday morning, I would say by the end of the day, or by the next morning, you should get a response. The response may be, I have to look into this. I mean, they may not yeah. have the answer for you. That, you know, it may take, they may have to speak to another person. But going back to having that conversation and acknowledging that you have a concern, that's important. And I would say, um, you know, if, if you're finding this is a problem, my advice is to request 
uh, not in a, a PPT meeting, because that's not what this is about. That's about changing IEPs to request a conference. And if it's with the teacher, I would, you don't want to go over people's heads and cause people to be, uh, I, I, I like to be respectful. So I would start with asking to have, and, and if you can, have a Zoom call with the teacher, because if you're if you're sitting there in front of the person, it's much easier and the tone is so much different than if you're on the phone. So just say, could we have a, you know, a 10 minute Zoom call? I, I really wanna share a concern. And then say, you know, I feel like I know you're busy and acknowledge that they are busy. I know you're busy, I know that, but what, you know, tell me, what do you think is a reasonable amount of time if I send an email that you can get back to me, at least to acknowledge that you've got it and are going to look into it. You might, I understand you might not always have the answer. So, and let them come up and let them come up with, uh, oh, I should be able to get back to you in a day or, um, you know, if it, by the end, you know, if you send it to me on Monday, by the end of the day on Tuesday or whatever, so that they come up with something. And then I would, I believe in always following up, then I would send them an email. So you have a copy sort of a collection of the fact. And I'd say, thank you. I always start out. Thank you so much for having the call with me today. Um, I'm really excited that, uh, that, you know, we've come to this agreement that when I send you an email, then I'm going to hear from you within 24 hours. I'm looking forward to continuing conversations. Very short. Now, and print up all that. I mean, you keep that, okay? And, and keep a list of this. Now, if it doesn't happen, then I would reach out to the principal or the assistant principal or the supervisor and say, you know what? I had this conversation. Um, we, you know, Mrs. or Mr. So-and-so agreed to this. And then for the last, you know, and I would give them one or two times, it's still not happening. I really, and what you're saying is, I really need your help. So now you're again, not critic. I just need your help. I tried and I don't know what to do, but I need your help because I feel like it's important when I have a concern that at least I know that the teacher read my email and is acknowledging it. Does that Can help? I interrupt for a second? I'm just curious because Marissa added one component to her um, question, which was about CCing people. And one of the things I have experienced with a lot of families is if they write to the entire team, that's often when they don't hear back. And I think sometimes that's because everybody thinks someone else might be replying. So if when you have the question of who am I actually addressing this to, I did have a point in time where my son's team said, we want you to communicate with everybody all the time. So I would address it to the person, the speech pathologist, if that's who my question is, and write, hey, Mary, blah, blah, blah. But everybody else would CC. So that sometimes is a reason why you don't get a reply. I don't know if that was a factor in your situation or not. Yeah. This might be more of like a technical question, <laughs> but in terms of like asking for educational records, I've been like searching everywhere for who do I actually at like when we want to request her educational records. I so I emailed the special ed people and the one admin person, but is that I would send it to do? the case manager. I would send okay. the request to the case manager, and in that case, I would send it to the case manager and CC an administrator. And that, okay. but you don't want to, another reason why, unless the team wants you to CC everybody, like, like mm -hmm. um, Jane is saying, I would not CC everybody because that can be intimidating. That's number one, it creates angst. Um, it might not be that they think, but they feel like they need to all have a conversation before they can get back to you to make sure they're all on the same page and that's not good. So I would, I would avoid that now. If you have something positive to say, you had a great meeting and you want to thank the team, you can CC the world because nobody ever complained about something nice being said and you don't even need an answer. But if you're going to have a problem or have a question, if, if it's just to the teacher, like if it's to the speech pathologist, just send it to them. Now, if they don't get back to you, then I always feel like, starting with one person who you think could be the nudger, because sometimes you'll find that if you send it to the speech pathologist and 
she doesn't get back to you. If you CC the building principal or the building assistant principal, whoever runs or the administrator who's in charge of these meetings, they may just say, you know what, I saw that, Mar you know, Marissa was still concerned and would you please get back to her? But if you do it to everyone, then it's overwhelming. So I would not do that. That's, I mean, that's just my, my take on, we don't want to, excuse me, we don't want to antagonize people. Thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> then uh, we have another person on the call and you only have a phone number. So I don't know, um, I can't refer to you as by name, but do you have anything you'd like to ask us? Oh, this is an ending poll. I can't hear you. You're muted, Jane. That was from me. We have just a quick um, poll for people to answer if um, if our folks that are here could could fill that out really quickly. Um, and otherwise, we are really at the end of our time. Is there anything, Peggy, you wanted to leave folks with? Uh, I, no, I just would like you to understand that it's more than what you say. It's how you say it and make sure that you really effectively communicate and don't just think you're communicating. You really, I go back to that um, illusion. You don't want there to be an illusion because that illusion causes communication breakdowns and misunderstandings and we don't want them. So please, um, you know, uh, I feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if there's any way I can be of help to anyone. Um, and Jane, thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight. I hope that people have learned something and have benefited from this. Vanessa, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think I'm good. I think you said it. You're telling me my story a lot. Presentation <laughs> <laughs> about I, goals and the communication. It's sometimes a struggle because as a parent, you want the best for your child, and then you try to express and communicate it with your district or your school, and not always is that easy. <laughs> to make that go, you know, to happen, to move forward. Sometimes I feel like, a, and I hear this from a lot of parents too, not only for my own experience, but for parents that I speak with, like the moving forward, sometimes a little hard to keep moving. I think like they drag too much and it goes. And like you say, you know, like if we're measuring, like why you need, the child needs to show four or five times. To me, if a child show twice that they are capable to do, sometimes a repetition, especially for special ed kids, sometimes can be overwhelmed, can be like a struggle repeating, uh, at least for my son is. So I think if you show me twice that you can do it, let's move on. I think sometimes the... Right. You're right. And, it, and it's not just the twice, but it could be twice over five times. So if they do it twice, five times, or three times in a row, three different. So it's not necessarily how many times, how many repetitions, but how freak. So because when we collect data, it's not just the number of repetitions, it's the frequency. It's the duration. How long can they sustain? If you're talking about eye contact, how long can they sustain something? So there's lots of different measures. And that's why, again, I think I go back to that smart goal thing where we really look at what are we really looking for and why that question, why do we want to do it? If they're asking, my question to you, Vanessa, is if they're asking that your son does it five times, it's about having a conversation. I see you want him to do it five times and you're saying this is a struggle for him. Why, why is this necessary? And then say, wouldn't, you know, if he can do it twice, and then tomorrow he can do it twice and the next day he can do it twice. Then that, you know, and you can then give an example of something, a story at home where he did this, you know, he, he asked for a cookie and then he asked for a cookie and then he asked for a cookie. I know he understands the word cookie. Um, and he didn't have to ask for a cookie three times. So give a story that highlights that on why you're thinking that way and have that conversation rather than saying, well, this isn't working because then the district gets on the defensive and you get on the defensive and nothing gets accomplished. And really remember, it's the conversation about what we're gonna do to get your child what he needs, not for you to feel comfortable. So I hope that answers that. Yes. 
Of Thanks, Peggy. And I see that Vanessa put our phone number and our email in the chat. So um, if you do have technical questions, please feel free to email us or call us with additional technical questions. And we can certainly put you in touch with Peggy if need be. All right. And if, uh, you know, if you, my, my email is very easy. It's Peggy at Peggy Bud, B -U -D, Dot com. So please feel free to reach out to me at Peggy at PeggyBud.com. And um, I'm happy to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think this was great. Bye bye. Yeah, we enjoyed having you. And I'm going to stop the recording.